The Coin Week podcast is brought to you by Certified Acceptance Corporation, CAC. When you look through auction prices realized like I do, you'll instantly take notice of the wide range of prices that similarly graded coins bring. Sometimes these differences can be quite significant. The reason for this is easy to understand. Serious collectors pay more for quality. And while two coins may be technically the same in terms of grade, no two coins are exactly alike. That is why collectors now more than ever look for the CAC green bean. With CAC approved coins, you know that your rare coins have been expertly reviewed by two teams of world-class graders. Protect yourself against run-of-the-mill coins. Next time you add a piece to your collection, ask your dealer to see his or her inventory of CAC coins. This week on the Coin Week podcast, we're joined by Ron Guth. Guth is an award-winning writer, researcher, founder of PCGS CoinFacts, and former president of PCGS. Now striking out on his own, Guth has developed a 100-point grading system that he says could reshape the coin market and help new collectors better understand coin grading. We tackle this tricky topic next on the Coin Week podcast. Hi, Ron. Thanks for joining me on the Coin Week podcast. Hey, Charles. Thanks for having me. So I got an interesting email from you yesterday morning that laid out the framework of a new grading scale that you've put forward that would take our current system that grades on a 70-point basis and expand it to 100. I wanted to reach out to you to discuss your idea and why you think the system by which we grade coins today should be revisited. Well, Charles, thanks for the opportunity to explain it. Um, The Sheldon scale was started, as you know, back in 1948, and it was based not on a a particular grading scale, but it was based on the value of 1794 large cents, which was one of Dr. Sheldon's favorite coins. And basically, he noticed by recording sales and prices that the best, the very best coin sold for 70 times the worst coin. So he built a scale that uh, ranked these prices and eventually came up with a 70-point grading scale with different divisions for, you know, like very fine, extremely fine. Uh, And that system was later expanded into other areas of coins until now it covers all U.S. coins and and even is used for worldwide coins. Uh, But the question today is, you know, why is 70 the very best coin? You know, a lot of people are used to uh, testing or scoring things on a 100-point scale. So new collectors come in, and it, the first question they ask is, why do you use 70 points instead of 100? And that question has been answered and answered and answered, you know, probably millions of times now. And I, I just believe that it would be a lot easier to explain a grading system to collectors if it was a little more logical. I think it's important for people to realize that when Sheldon came up with his 70-point scale, such as it was, It was almost immediately broken, because with the publication of his book Penny Whimsy in 1958 came an intense interest in 1794 cents. The 70-point scale was meant to assign values to that coin based on condition, and in the years that followed, the value of that coin became unmoored with Sheldon's pre-1958 observations. Not to mention the fact that there has never been an MS70 1794 cent based on the definitions of perfection that exist today. Even the best-looking 1794 cents in 1958 would have had naked-eye visible problems. None, I believe, would have been able to be described as fiery red. Nevertheless, Sheldon tried to apply mathematical formulations to make his pseudo-scientific exercise work. He even employed the help of a young Walter Breen to that task. But both failed to make anything stick. The coin market is not built on mathematical formulations, but on the eccentricities of supply and demand the deepness of pocketbooks and human desire. But let's put all that aside, even as it pertains to our current understanding of the Sheldon scale, which is, like I said, an homage to Sheldon, not a precise replication of his system. The Sheldon scale that we use was developed over multiple collecting generations, and it has evolved from something that painted too broad a brush, especially for mint state coins, to a system that would gradually fill in the grades, like MS64, which came into being at the behest of the silver dollar dealer community 
to create a new pricing tier between Choice and Gem Coins. It's all the plus grades that both grading services employ today to denote superior coins of the grade. So if you're a collector that likes to see things remain the way they are, you have to realize that the market that you know today is always in a state of flux. It's always adjusting. In some ways, this is good, but in other ways, maybe not so much. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the grading system has definitely evolved. Uh, and part of that is, as you say, driven by pricing. Uh, if a uh, 1794 large cent, if the difference between an uh, MS60 and an MS65 is only, you know, a few dollars, it's no big deal. You don't need to split the grades. But when the values rose tremendously, um, you need to split it up a little bit uh wider because, you know, there are coins that are worth 5000 or coins that are worth 5500 7000 10000 and you need to be able to account for those. And that's why these intermediate grades uh, were, were added to it. And Sheldon's scale uh, was expandable because, um, you know, he, it was from 0 to 70, and you can, you can, in theory, use every point along that line. Uh, but as prices have increased, uh, you need more points. Uh, especially on the high end. One of the things that I always found interesting about this topic, if your collector has been in the hobby for more than a few years and has educated yourself to the point where you're fairly sophisticated in whatever the series is that you collect, you'll know that there's essentially two types of coins. You know, you have your snowflake coins and your widget coins. The snowflake coin will stand out no matter what series it's in, what date it was made, or what grade has been assigned in the holder. It's the kind of coin that you look at and you know that it's unique and you should have an expression of wow when you hold it. A widget coin, on the other hand, is a coin that you hold and again, could be nice, could be accurately graded, but it's a coin that basically evokes the feeling of, yep, this is a coin. And I think the basis for the idea of commoditizing coins, which is what this industry set out to do when it devised third-party grading as a business, is not to validate the snowflake coin, but to market the widget coins and package widgets as investment instruments to a type of client who wasn't too concerned about admiring each coin as an individual work of art, but instead wanted to put volumes of these coins aside to suppress the supply of the coins in the marketplace and put upward pressure on price. But two things didn't materialize with this concept. One, sustained demand for bulk buying of widgets didn't develop, in part due to the fact that the premise of stockpiling coins and selling them to eager collectors for a profit requires a sufficient infusion of new collectors who are eager to buy at these advanced pricing levels, and also due to the fact that no two coins are alike. The no two coins are alike is obvious to coin collectors, but to form a perfect mental picture, Imagine 20 or 50 same graded coins laid out on a table. You'd likely be able to separate them easily, I would think. Some percentage would be exceptional, you'd put those aside. Some percentage would be ordinary, the middle tier. And some percentage would appear poor in comparison to all the others. And how these coins are parsed out may differ uh, from collector to collector, because each of us has our own aesthetics. Uh, and some people may only collect brilliant coins, others like rainbow-toned coins, others like crusty coins because they give the appearance of originality. So these aesthetics would factor into how you separate the coins on this table. And so even in this sophisticated and highly personalized approach to coin grades, we're left with the fact that the grade itself doesn't sufficiently answer the question, which coins are finer than the rest? There have been multiple efforts over the years to create a condition census that takes into account a ranking system for each date and variety for certain series. These rankings sometimes align with what the professional grading services have put on to the holder, but sometimes not. And also, some series have multiple condition census carried out by multiple experts, and because coins can be so similar in grade, and because coin grading is an act of compromise, Experts may disagree in which coins are better than the others. So even in a hobby where you have firmly established commercial grading, a system that has added billions of dollars of market liquidity over the course of three decades, you still have a system where experts disagree about the quality of a coin. Does your system set out to do anything to change this landscape? 
Uh, no, I do not. Uh, the the issues you raise are pretty obvious. Um, when you when you try to assign a numerical grade to a coin, I mean, you're distilling down a number of different factors, including the stuff that you mentioned, like you know the original crust, the eye appeal, that sort of thing. You're trying to distill it into a single grade, and that works pretty well for generic coins, the so-called widgets. Uh, because, you know, it, it really doesn't matter what they look like. Uh, you know, a $20 Saint in 63, you know, there's – sure, you can pick out a good one from a batch of 20, but in general, people don't care on widgets. Now, when you talk about the Snowflake coins or the condition rarities, uh, yeah, they're – there you actually need a long, lengthy description, and, and you can't rely upon a single grade, but it's a great starting point. Uh, if something is an MS-67 and, and it's the only 67 uh, surrounded by 65s, you know it's the finest known. You really don't have to say anything else. But if it's a group of 67s, uh, you might have to describe, and that's where the auction catalog descriptions come in. You know, they talk about the luster, the strike, the color, the toning, the originality, the eye appeal. So, yeah, you, you will always need a lengthier description on special coins. That's that's going to be the case no matter what. But, again, the grading system, which assigns a single numerical grade, is a good starting point. And I want to be clear with people. You know, if you're the type of person that participates in numismatic forums or goes to coin clubs, you might you might hear the old chestnut, by the coin and not the holder. The correct interpretation for me of this statement isn't that coin grades aren't to be trusted, but instead that the grade on the insert is just a bullet point. It's a jumping off point to what should be a larger conversation. Is the coin nice? What does the coin say to me? The coin is the most important thing, you know, that's what we collect. We don't collect MS-66s, we collect Morgan dollars. We don't collect 70s, we collect Silver Eagle proofs. And so, if you collect Mercury Dimes and you want a phenomenal coin, you can find that coin and maybe it's graded MS67FB or maybe it's graded MS68FB. And it doesn't really matter which is which so long as the coin's all there and it really says something to you when you hold it. Furthermore, to pay a significant premium for a high graded coin when it does nothing for you emotionally, when you could pay less money to get a coin that really grabs your attention is just plain dumb. Charles, you're, you're absolutely right. I couldn't have said it better. It, it, collecting coins really boils down to personal taste. What do you want to collect? What should the coins look like? Uh, it, it's definitely a personal opinion, a personal desire. And desires change from collector to collector. So what one person views as the finest known coin may not be the most desirable coin to another collector. Uh, but again, the grade... Uh, especially for those who aren't sophisticated or are starting out, it's it's a protection for them to a certain extent uh, and, a, and a starting point for them to either learn how to grade or understand how the grading system works. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of your 100-point grading system. Explain to us how it works and how someone already familiar with the 70-point scale could quickly do the conversion and how do you see the implementation of your new system taking place to change the way we buy and sell coins? Sure. One of the issues um, with the 100-point grading scale is that there are, you know, how many tens of millions of coins out there that have already been graded under the 70-point scale. So in order to, to move to a 100-point grading scale, you have to develop a system that is not – completely disruptive to what's already out there. And that's been the difficulty, because if you try to convert, let's say, mathematically from a 70-point uh, scale to a 100-point scale, you end up with these weird numbers. Um, you know, if you multiply every number by 10 divided by 7, you get, you know, fractions, you get uh, decimals, and you also get duplicate numbers when you start rounding. So, so that method of converting doesn't work very well. Uh, the other issue you have is that you, you've got a scale from 1 to 70, and how do you expand the high end, the 60 to 70 scale, 
uh, without creating confusion in the marketplace. Like, you can't have a current 63 become a current or, or, or a new 69. I mean, there, it just it just doesn't work. Uh, so you have to develop a scale that allows you to leave the existing system in place but create an expansion on the high end. And the, the, really, the only way to do that that I've found is to create a new level from 80 to 100. And that would be for mint state or proof coins that are currently graded under the 60 to 70 scale. Uh, people say, well, why don't you use uh, the numbers from 71 to 80? Well, we really don't need 30 points for uh, the the high-end coins, the mint state and proof coins. Uh, it's too much. And again, it would create a little bit of confusion because all of a sudden we're seeing 73s in the market, 75s, and there's not enough of a separation between the, the two grading scales to eliminate the confusion. Uh, to convert on the from the 70 to the got the 100 point coin grading scale, uh, we have a conversion table at expertnumismatics.com, and that shows that the old 70 becomes the new 100, the old 60 becomes a new 80, and all of the fractional grades or the plus grades now become whole numbers, like a 60 plus becomes an 81. So it's very easy to convert and just do a, a direct conversion that way. So in your system, you're keeping in place what is essentially the current system for coins graded cull up to AU58, aside from using the grade 59 for an AU58 plus. Are you filling in grades where the Sheldon scale omits them? Because as you know, the Sheldon scale doesn't use every number from 0 to 58. Yeah, that's a good point. The uh, and the the got the hundred point scale is not does not utilize all one hundred points either. Uh, but to answer your question, the new system uh, keeps the old Sheldon scale in place. In other words, the numbers from one to uh, fifty nine uh, don't change at all. Uh, and the purpose of this was to expand on the high end and to, and to take us up to the hundred point. Uh, so we actually ignore the uh, 71 to 79 grades. Those aren't used at all. Um, and I, I don't anticipate any need for that in the future. If we want to expand even further, if that ever becomes necessary in the future, I suppose that we could expand and add uh, decimals or plus grades to the 80 to 100. But, I mean, that's uh, – people have already complained that, uh, it's too difficult to tell the difference between a half grade under the current system, so I can't imagine uh, how we could get into even further deline delineation on the higher end of the 100-point scale. I want to ask you this question, not because I'm trying to box you in or pick on you. I know you have quite a bit of experience in the market. As a former head of PCGS, you know as well as anybody how grading services operate. I find the implementation of the plus grading system to be impractical for certain segments of the mint state scale. An MS60 or MS61 coin really doesn't need a half-step delineation. These coins are either net graded, which I think is a no-no, or so impaired that one really isn't going to find gem quality examples in these two tiers. On the upper end, I think splitting hairs on an MS69 plus is stretching things a bit as well. So do you think we even need this many grades as you expand the grading system to 100.1? That's a good question. On the the lower end of the min state and proof scale, you're right, there is a, a big variety of uh, issues that create those lower grades, like hairlines, bag marks, ugly toning, that sort of thing. Uh, and the system does not require you to make those sort of split grades, uh, but they're there if needed. Uh, I think even under the existing 70-point scale, I'm pretty sure, and, uh, you know, I can be corrected, but I don't think PCGS even uses a 60.5 grade. So it's really not necessary under the new system, but it exists in case it ever needs to be used. Do you think it'll be enough for a collector to look at the grade assigned to a coin and note that if the coin carries a grade of 60 to 70, then it is 
mint state as per the old scale. And if it's graded 80 to 100, it is mint state graded from the Guff 100 point scale. Uh, it's really not a confusion of methodology methodologies, uh, but it is a difference in the numbering. And people say, well, why why would I take my MS63 and convert it to a 100-point grade? Uh, or why would I want my 70 to become 100? Well, you know, the natural collecting instinct or a human instinct is to get the highest number possible. Uh, so... If a collector is given the choice between having a coin graded under the old system as a 70 or under the new system as a 100, which do you think they would choose? Well, I think it just comes down to a matter of collector culture at that point. If you've matured in the present system, you're well familiar with it and accustomed to it. I'm sure the same could be said once the ANA introduced Mint State numerical grading in the 1970s. A lot of people were confused about the new nomenclature. If the coin hobby goes to a 100-point system, there will be a period of customization for collectors who are experienced in the hobby before. Those coming into the hobby may be more accustomed to the new system. Although at some point, the question will be asked, what of the omitted numbers between 60 and 80? However, where I see this idea having the most potential is in the marketing of coins to the general public through telemarketers or TV shows, areas where potential collectors are not yet exposed to our current system. Those same people that you said would require an explanation as to why we chose 70 to be the highest grade in our system. The number 100 may be more culturally familiar for them as a number assigned to perfection than the number 70 is. Uh, well, that's a very good point. Uh, it, the system is not designed to, you know, help out telemarketers or, you know, uh, create demand uh, other than what's desired by the collecting public. But, but I agree with you. It's going to be a lot easier to sell a coin that's a hundred than it is a seventy because you don't have to go through that explanation process that that can become really uh, difficult. It's illogical. It's illogical, and so it's a lot easier. Uh, to make the sale when the customer understands quickly what you're trying to convey. What would your pitch be to people who have participated in the hobby for several years and are already locked in with the present system? Do you think it's incumbent upon them to embrace this change because it would make for a better experience? Also, do you think that they should be concerned that if the hobby goes down your path, that it will adversely affect the value of their coins, which have already been graded, because they've been graded with the old system? Or perhaps a third question, do you see both systems being able to exist side by side? Well, that's, that's one of the, what I call the geniuses of this new system is that they can coexist. There is no urgency for collectors under the existing system to convert. There's no pressure to do so. Uh, you can still keep your 60 to 70 coins. You don't have to convert anything. Um, and so, so the, the demand for the new system, you know, we're not trying to oppose this on the industry. We're not trying to say that, oh, you have to convert all those millions of coins that have already been graded into the 100 point grading system. You don't have to do that. It, it, it can be done whenever you want, as you wish. And again, I believe that the demand will come from the consumers. Uh, obviously, it would be great if the grading services embrace the system because that will help it, you know, come into place more quickly. But if we rely on consumer demand, which I believe will be there simply because people want the higher numbers, uh, that will take place over time. Uh, anytime you have a system that's new, you want to have some help implementing it. So it's either going to be demand driven from the customers or, uh, you know, essentially forced upon them by the grading services. But that doesn't take place in, under this new system. You can choose either one. Maybe a non-related question, um, but do you foresee a point in time when the way coins are graded becomes less subjective and more data driven? Do you think that uh, we might get to the point where human subjectivity is replaced somewhat by sophisticated computer analysis? I, I, th I think it's entirely possible, and I, I look forward to the day, actually, when we do use uh, computer grading to uh, evaluate coins. I mean, there are certain 
aspects of a coin that can be quantified very easily, and that would be like the number of surface marks, the uh, depth of the strike, uh, you know, all, all these issues. What you can't really quantify objectively is like eye appeal, those things that you mentioned earlier that, that make one coin stand out above another. But certainly there are, there are many aspects of a coin that can be quantified easily with a computer. And let's say you just assign a, a numerical grade based on those factors, and then you allow the consumer to uh, judge the other factors and decide, you know, which is a more preferable coin. But, yeah, I, I think computer grading um, is certainly, especially today with the new technologies, I mean, you look at the photography, the digital photography, and the ability to plate match coins, uh, you know, to say, oh, this coin was once here, now it's here. Uh, you know those those things are they they are real now, and there's no reason that we can't take advantage of them. I think the best way forward is a hybrid approach. Um, I would prefer to see a system that properly employs sophisticated computer imaging and chemical analysis, coupled with the expert opinion of a trained grader. The computer would look for contact marks, contamination, quality of strike, etc. The human would take this data into account and measure that against how the coin looks and come up with a grade that blends the two disciplines. Then the computer would learn how to grade coins based on the data it receives after thousands and thousands of examples are graded and seeing where the human overruled it. It would also be able to spot coins that had previously been submitted and tell if the coins have degraded or were purposely altered and inform the expert grader. If the way we graded coins was more consistent, I think the market would be less volatile when dealing with condition rarities. Yeah, I agree. I think the, uh, you're right. The computer is a starting point, a very good starting point. And then you have the, uh, the expert grader come in and make the final evaluation. I think that will always be required. But, yeah, I think consistency in grading um, would would be very helpful. And, uh, you know, the the issues we have, of people selecting one coin over another because of, you know, personal preferences. We still want, we still have to know what the coin is to begin with. Um, if you decide that I'm only going to collect MS65s, it would be great to just have a selection of 65s to choose from and then go from there. But you want to make sure that those 65s are consistently graded. They all pretty much look alike except for minor differences. Uh, and then the collector can decide which one they want to add to their collection, which one they think is the most attractive, which one meets their desires the best. But, yeah, I think consistency in grading uh, is a desired outcome of all this stuff, uh, but that, that really doesn't have anything to do with the grading system itself, uh, but the grading system is an ideal that we aspire to, and then we just try to use whatever – technologies we have to to do our very best to adhere to that standard. And of course, based on your proposed system, that 65 would be a 90. Yes, that's correct. Ron, I appreciate you letting us know about this. I know this is still early in the process for you. I know you plan to work with uh, potential partners to see if there's a place uh, for this idea in the hobby. Calls for a 100-point system have been made many times by many uh, professional dealers. But now you have put forward your idea, and we'll have to wait and see how the market responds to it. I wish you luck. Well, thank you, Charles. I appreciate uh, uh, talking to you about it, and uh, we'll see what happens. All right, Ron. I appreciate you taking the time to call. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. And remember, you can download more than 100 episodes of the Coin Week podcast for free from the iTunes store or stream online from coinweek.com. For Coin Week, I'm editor Charles Morgan. Until next time, happy collecting.